Thank you to Surfshark for sponsoring this video, and thank you to all of the amazing patrons that help make these videos possible. Also, I've been streaming on Twitch recently, every Tuesday and most Thursdays, so follow me there, the link's below. So I've mentioned this a couple of times in the past, but I'm actually half Iranian on my dad's side. Here's a picture of me with him at my wedding. My mother is white and British, but my dad was born in Tehran and then later moved to the UK back to the 70s to study and has lived there longer than he has his homeland. As someone who is also an immigrant, having moved from the UK to the US, I've begun to gain some understanding of how we must have felt to try and assimilate into another culture, and although the two countries I can legally call home have some similarities, there are also some significant differences which have made me wonder whether I'll truly ever get used to things here. It can feel alienating and at times lonely when you're around people who will never truly understand your experiences and culture, even when said culture happens to be British, something which Americans have been exposed to frequently, but through the lens of the media, which often romanticizes the country and doesn't really bother with realism. Because I grew up with an Iranian dad though, my cultural experience was different from most Brits as well. Naturally, he is a man whose worldview and behavior is influenced by the culture he grew up in. From his experiences with his own father and ideologies found within Iranian culture. Understandably, there have been some clashes. I obviously spent most of my time around British people and as such I wanted to fit in. I heard about their experiences and thought about how they differed from mine and even though my dad didn't try to fully immerse me in Iranian culture, his own ideals would sometimes conflict with British culture, something which I now understand better since I live among a culture with many qualities that I personally find questionable. I question these because I grew up in a culture that did things differently and in many ways I see it as better, but this is something that's natural. There are plenty of Americans who see their way of doing things as the ideal because they've been told that it is, and the country's standing in the world is enough evidence to them that it's doing something right, even though outsiders feel otherwise. However, you may have noticed that even though my dad looks like this, I look like this. When you look at my dad, you can immediately identify him as someone who isn't white, and most would guess correctly that he's Middle Eastern. I, on the other hand, am white. My skin is white, and most people see me as a white person, with some occasional exceptions where Middle Eastern people have been able to recognize some of my facial features or the origin of my last name, which, for clarification, is actually Solari. Regardless of that though, I have been able to go through my life as a white person, and as such I have been afforded the privileges given to white people. Iranians, like many other people from the Middle East, have experienced an intense amount of discrimination from the Western world, and although around half of my racial makeup is Iranian, I've mostly not been subjected to discrimination for it because I get to hide behind my skin color. I can be in the company of other white people and they will see me as someone who's no different from them, as someone whose experiences growing up were largely identical to them. Being white also allows some people to believe that they're in good company when sharing certain thoughts and opinions that they probably wouldn't have had my genes turned out just a little bit differently. In essence, my skin allows me to hide in plain sight among other whites, and if you don't mind, I'd like to talk about that for a bit. In this day and age, all of us are almost constantly online, whether it's your PC, Mac, laptop, watch, tablet, TV, games console, smart speaker, fridge, plastic book, Microsoft Zoom, light bulbs, or even your phone, which you're probably watching this on right now. Hopefully not on the toilet, because that's gross. However, the internet isn't always a safe place, nor is it always open to you. ISPs and marketing companies can view your activity wherever you go online and even see where you are in the world, hence why you see so many eerily specific and accurate ads. So what are you going to do? 
use fake names and addresses, go through the long and costly process of applying for an international visa, not use the internet, well, there's no need thanks to this video sponsor, Surfshark. Surfshark is a VPN or virtual private network which can provide you with protection whenever and wherever you are online, while opening up parts of the internet that are closed off to you. It does this through its simple, easy to use app which routes your connection through one of its thousands of servers around the world and encrypts your data, ensuring that you have a private and protected experience while you're online. But what about that content that's not available in your country? Say no more, fam. Do people say that still? If you connect to Surfshark through the app or browser extension, it can open up content available on platforms like YouTube, Netflix, and more. You can even access content on sites like BBC iPlayer, which would normally only be available in the UK. It works across a bunch of different devices, including your phone and laptop. It's extremely easy to use, and your internet speeds remain fast and stable. It also makes using unprotected public Wi-Fi far more safer, so you don't have to worry about hackers who wear hoodies in dark rooms, stealing your data, which apparently every hacker looks like, according to stock footage sites. Regardless of who you are or how you spend your time online, Surfshark is great for everyone. And right now, if you enter the code SOLARI at the checkout or use the link in the description, you can save 83% on your subscription and get an additional three months for free. You also have a 30-day money-back guarantee if for some reason you're not satisfied. I've been using Surfshark for a very long time now and I honestly think that it's excellent and great value. Start surfing the web safely today. All right, before we go any further with this, uh, there's a thing or two that I think I need to clarify because I'm sure that after that opening, there are some people who already have their opinions. And when something like that happens, it can be difficult to convince them otherwise, especially when it's a subject that people are really passionate about. I just really wanted to make clear that this video isn't me trying to convince you that I or anyone else like me has experienced the same or similar levels of discrimination that people of color have. In fact, it's quite the opposite. Since a large part of what I'm about to talk about is about the privilege that white skin affords people. I have experienced some discrimination due to the non-white part of my ethnicity, as have my family members, and I'll talk about that later, but these have been under very specific circumstances that are not identical to the type experienced by people who have no choice in how they're perceived by others due to the colour of their skin. With that in mind, I really hope that you don't think that I'm trying to embellish my experiences or that I'm saying something like, yeah, I, I totally get the racism that you had to put up with. Yeah, we're, we're, we're just the same, you and me, or anything like that, you know? Oh, and if you are someone that clicked on this and feels the need to talk about how whites experience uh, racism on the same level as people of color, just don't. It, it's not the same, and if you want proof of that, just piss off a cop and see what happens. White skin is a privilege, and I'd be lying if I said that I wasn't fortunate to be born with white features, despite the possibility of my dad's genes giving me features that would drastically alter how other people see me. I've known other people who have one white parent and one Middle Eastern parent, but their skin isn't white. And because of this, our experiences have been drastically different. They have been victims of overt racism and discrimination by others because of the color of their skin. I believe it's also worth mentioning that, for the sake of clarity, the differences between the social construct of race and ethnicity. For example, whiteness has had numerous definitions over the years, and that's largely due to white supremacist ideologies, such as how Italians weren't considered as white for a long time before they were interpolated into whiteness as a means of weaponizing them against black people. So even though they're ethnically Italian and always have been, their race has been socially constructed and determined by forces external to them. White privilege, or white skin privilege, however you want to call it, allows people such as myself to operate in white spaces with little to no fear of being discriminated, and unlike other mixed race people who have a visibly different skin colour, I actually have a choice as to whether to let that other part of my ethnicity be known, which in itself is a privilege. 
I get to make a judgment on when and how to tell others that I'm half Iranian and whether it's safe to let people know and get a feel for how they will react to it before I tell them. If I believe that I'm in good company and feel that they won't discriminate, I can decide to tell them. If I'm among people who have Islamophobic sentiments, then that might pose a problem. Then I have the choice of continuing to be seen as a fellow white person who is no different from the rest of them. In the past, it used to be the case where whenever I found myself around people who expressed hostility towards non-whites, I would choose to remain a white person who's no different from them out of fear of being othered by the group. I didn't do it because I wanted to continue associating with them or establish a friendship since I'd rather not hang out with racists, I just wanted to not be discriminated against. As I've gotten older though, I've been less inclined to keep my Middle Eastern background a secret and whether it's due to maturity, self-acceptance or both, I started to care less about how others see me. I also learned that I can actually weaponize my ability to hide in plain sight among other whites and sort of deliver a sneak attack when given the right opportunity. Allow me to explain with a couple of stories. I know it's early in the video for these, but I don't know. They're interesting and I think it helps set the foundations. So the last place I worked at, my job involved dealing with clients face to face in a part of North Carolina that wasn't the most progressive of places. Like there was literally a chapter of the KKK not far from where we lived. As such, the people there had some pretty spicy takes on race. Shocking, I know. One day, I was dealing with a client, a woman probably in her late 50s, early 60s. At first, she was quite friendly, nothing out of the ordinary. Typical boomer chit-chat, probably about how much she loves minions or something. It's not important. But then, literally out of nowhere, she starts talking about the then-recent airstrike on Syria, by the US, in which 16 people were killed, most of which were civilians. Ignoring the fact that it's weird enough to bring up such a sensitive and awful event with someone who's a stranger, one that is at work, no less, and has to abide by different social conventions, but what she said next was truly disgusting, and I was so stunned that I remember every word verbatim. With just a hint of glee, she said, I'm glad they bombed those people, and I hope that they wipe out the rest of those countries. Yeah. Think about that for a second. Despite knowing nothing about me and having exchanged only a handful of pleasantries, this white woman felt comfortable enough to share her desire for literal genocide to another white person. I won't deny that there could be things going on with her that prevent her from filtering more inflammatory statements, but nonetheless it was said, and it's safe to say that if I was brown-skinned, it wouldn't have been said. Now, bear in mind that I was at work here, and that can mean that your paycheck often means that you've got to keep your opinions to yourself. However, this person just suggested that the entire Muslim population should be wiped out, including many of my family members who live in Iran and elsewhere in the Middle East. So I thought, f*** it, let her know. What's she gonna do, complain to my boss that I called her out for wanting to wipe out nearly half a billion people? Josh is cool, he'll have my back. That's not Josh. I told her that I'm actually half Iranian, that my dad's from Iran, that I have a lot of family over there, and she just told me to my face that she didn't want them to exist. Suddenly, she became excessively apologetic, claiming that she didn't really mean it, which I also called her out for, saying that obviously she did, obviously she wouldn't have said it. Being the professional that I am, I finished my job, bid her farewell, and she later apologized again, but I just walked away. I wanted her to feel bad for what she said and what she believes. American news outlets like Fox News and OAN, along with far-right think tanks, personalities, and the Bush and Trump administrations have been dehumanizing Muslims around the world for years, portraying them as uncivilized evildoers who hate America because they hate freedom and want totalitarianism. This woman was the result of that indoctrination, and after what she said, I wanted to illustrate how her desire for destruction can have an effect on people. You could absolutely argue that in some way it was me saying that what she wants will affect white people too, but what I wanted to say was that 
a person who she felt perfectly comfortable interacting with and seeing as worthy of living, and the product of a Middle Eastern person, of a Muslim which she's been convinced to hate for no good reason. I wanted her to see some humanity and understand that if her wishes came true, she'd be killing the family members of the person stood in front of her. I don't necessarily like to believe that your average person is willingly evil. More often it's the case that it's a combination of being misguided and ignorant while not knowing any better. I think the closest thing to bona fide evil would probably be someone in power like a politician or someone with immense wealth. The kind of people who wield their power to knowingly hurt those with less privilege in the hopes of attaining more power. There's a reason many of the most successful CEOs are textbook psychopaths, because they're unburdened by empathy. It's still probably not evil, but it's a closer approximation to it. Ignorance can still be a dangerous thing though, partly because of the damage it can cause, but because a person may not know how ignorant they are, and if you're a mixed race with white skin, it's amazing to see how comfortable people feel about sharing the awful things they believe to be true. Another client I dealt with at the same job asked me about my accent, something which is you know, very common. So I told the man from England, and usually when this happens, I tend to get asked the exact same questions every single time. And it's, uh, whereabouts in England? How long have you been here? How can you moved? And how do you like it here? Which is one hell of a loaded question to ask someone. If they're elderly, I usually just say, eh, it's pretty nice. If they're like 40 or younger, I'm more honest with them and say that it sucks, which America does suck unless you're really wealthy, yeah. With this person though, after they asked where I'm from, they said, I bet you're glad to get out of there. I was a bit confused, because up until this point, I'd never heard anyone say this, so I replied, why is that? He said, because it's been taken over by Muslims, hasn't it? Just think about that for a moment. This person fully believed that the entire United Kingdom, a country with a population of almost 68 million people, of which only 3.9 million are Asian, a figure which isn't just specific to just Muslims, had been entirely taken over by a religious regime, and in his eyes, I had escaped it. So I asked, why did you hear about this? And tell you what, let's play a little game. I'll give you three guesses as to what it was. Was it A, Fox News? B, it's Fox News. Of course it is. It's always Fox News. Every time. So I told them it wasn't true. Let it be known that I have Muslim family members and that it's insulting to imply that they intend to take over the country. He apologized and we spent the remaining time in silence, finished up my job and... Then he left again after saying sorry. Again. Honestly, I have so many stories similar to these, and I could fill this video's entire runtime just sharing them, and those two I just told you aren't even the most shocking things that I've heard. You know that saying about people saying the quiet part loud? White skin gives me access to the quiet part. If you're a white person, I'm sure that you've probably heard others share similar things with you, but hearing discrimination that in some way affects you without the other person knowing that they're doing so elicits some complicated emotions. You can't really know how much hatred they have, how it changes what they think of you when you let them know who you are. This isn't something that's unique to people in my position, no. One group in particular has faced intense racial discrimination for centuries, despite being largely white-skinned. Of course, I'm talking about Jewish people, who to this day are the victims of intense anti-Semitism around the world. The history of Jewish persecution is extremely long and well documented. For as long as Jews have existed, they've faced discrimination from all kinds of groups for a variety of reasons, from believing that they're genetically inferior or that they're a shady cabal who secretly runs the world from the shadows. Many people are still shockingly comfortable sharing anti-Semitic rhetoric, whether that's through overtly name-checking the Jewish population as antagonists or through more discreet terminology like referring to them as the elites, the Illuminati, and of course Alex Jones's favourite, globalists. 
Like any dog whistle though, these are terms that exist for the sake of plausible deniability in case of being called out for anti-Semitism. Someone might use these terms or their many, many variants and can claim that it's not what they meant and you can't prove their intent. A lot of anti-Semitism is both overt and casual, the kind that's been deemed supposedly acceptable for public use and incorporated into people's vocabulary, often without them even knowing that it's actually anti-Semitism. Obviously it's hard to prove whether someone uses these words because they're anti-Semitic or if they're just oblivious, but regardless Regardless of intent, the usage is emblematic of the prevalence of anti-Semitism. If you've seen Nathan Fielder's show, The Rehearsal, which you should, by the way, because it is brilliant, uh, you may remember the moment where he was overseeing a conversation between a man called Patrick and an actor playing his brother. It's a weird show. While Patrick is attempting to convince his brother Standin that his girlfriend isn't, in his words, a gold digger, he very casually uses anti-Semitic language, which I won't repeat, to explain that she's too frugal with money to squander it, which Nathan Fielder, a Jewish man, notices and thankfully addresses. Jewish people in general have a hard time knowing where they stand with others because of the various forms of anti-Semitism present throughout society. Although most people are aware of the more obvious forms of it, there are still many other stigmas that are much vaguer but still harmful and puts them in a position where they can feel unsafe letting people know that they're Jewish, or thanks to the belief that they have a monopoly on power and influence across the world, people can assume that anti-Semitism is acceptable since it's essentially punching upwards. There are also some who argue that Jews don't qualify as a minority, and that a person's status as one should be purely based on the colour of their skin and not their ethnicity. Given the history of persecution against Jewish people, I don't think this is very fair, and ultimately minimises the discrimination that they've had to endure for centuries. I happen to be married to a Jewish woman, who's had some interesting and sometimes incredibly uncomfortable experiences. She's had to contend with her identity throughout her life, and how others perceive that, and at times she's had to deal with prejudice from a very young age. In her own words, here's her account on what it was like growing up Jewish in a largely Christian area. My wife had to muster up some courage to do this, so be nice to her in the comments, please. My mom is Jewish, and through the 23andMe test, we found her pretty much of 100% Ashkenazi heritage. On her side of the family, my great-grandparents came over from Russia and settled in New York City, and my dad and his side of the family are white and can trace their ancestry in North Carolina for many generations. My 23andMe results logically came back to say I'm 50% Ashkenazi, and while I may genetically be 50%, I feel like I fully identify as Jewish. While I was raised to be Jewish in religion, and was considered fully Jewish in terms of that, it was the culture that I identified with since my mother's side of the family tended to dominate holidays and my dad's side of the family was more casual and laid back, my dad being an atheist probably as a result of attending Catholic school in the 1950s. The Ashkenazi Jewish population is a genetically distinct one, believed to have arisen from 250 to 420 individuals 25 to 32 generations ago, tending to have ancestry in Central and Eastern European countries. Without going into complexities, the genetics behind people with Ashkenazi ancestry are really interesting as they show distinctions from non-Jewish European and Middle Eastern groups, kind of serving as an intermediate between the two. As someone with a background in molecular biology, I could say a lot about the interesting aspects of the genetics of Ashkenazi populations, and I feel proud to have that as a part of me, but another part of me feels a sense of fear in discussing it as well. There's always a part of me that worries that it'll fuel someone's anti-Semitism, since white supremacists believe Jewish people are of a completely different race. I feel like talking about it too much comes across as validating to that side of things, and in my ideal world, and I'm sure yours too, white supremacists wouldn't exist and Jewish people could openly feel more pride in their ancestry. So even though white supremacists don't think I'm white, I think I'm white, but I also don't feel like I identify with most white people because of the aspects of Jewish culture I was raised around and the experiences I had growing up differ slightly. In general, it feels scary and awkward talking about any of this because 
There's a lot of gray areas between religious discrimination, even though I'm not religious, and really everything involved in this, and other people absolutely have it worse, so I feel like it doesn't really matter sometimes. I remember being chased around by bullies on the playground because, according to them, I had personally killed Jesus or something. I had kids in my class say, my mom told me I shouldn't talk to you, and then say something that implies it was because I was Jewish. Whenever I went to a friend's house for dinner and got blank stares when I didn't know we were supposed to say grace before eating, I felt bad having my friend whisper to me not to eat yet like if their parents found out we would get in trouble, and I'm sure all kids that weren't raised as Christian are familiar with that experience. When I was growing up, my parents didn't try to push Judaism on me, but we did celebrate the mainstream Jewish holidays, and I went to summer camp at the Jewish community center, and I feel like I was brought up for it to be a big part of my identity and something that made me special. I was fascinated and wanted to know more about Judaism, so I asked to go to Hebrew school. My parents hired a tutor over the summer to teach my friend and me how to read and write the language, and I thought it was the coolest. At Hebrew school, I also felt like an outsider because I just didn't believe the religious aspects of Judaism, but still felt most of my identity was attached to the culture. All in all, I still feel very confused about everything. I don't know which is right, and depending on which side I take, it's probably going to upset someone, and I feel like that shouldn't be the case. I genuinely don't want to upset anyone, and just want to be comfortable with my identity and for others to be too. Leave a comment if you want me to take over Solari's videos. <laughs> When discussing aspects of being multiracial, the inevitable and complicated question of identity can't be ignored. Like with the many other forms of it, identity can be something that's defined both internally and externally. You may identify yourself in a certain way and even let it be known to others, but it's also possible that people can deny you of your identity. It could be because they fail to understand, or more cruelly, because they want to reject it. This of course isn't something that's exclusive to racial identity, it could be a person's sexual orientation, their gender identity, and so forth, but identity is important to all of us. It's something that's affirming and helps us feel more comfortable with our place in the world. We all want to be recognized for what we are and when that's denied, it can leave people feeling alienated. Mixed race identity can be tricky because there isn't a single way of defining it. A person could identify themselves simply as mixed race or biracial, or they may veer more towards a certain part of their racial makeup. In the study, fluid racial presentations, perceptions of contextual passing among biracial people by Albuja et al. Is it et al? Et al. They concluded that biracial identity can sometimes be fluid and sometimes influenced by environment. 30% of their respondents reported that their racial identification has changed one or more times throughout their life. This makes sense when you compare the US census data over the past 10 years, where you can see a significant increase in the amount of people who identify as multiracial from only 9 million in 2010 to 33.8 million in 2020, which is a massive 276% increase. This number, in reality, is more than likely much higher because the US Census is notorious for undercounting minorities or miscategorizing them. For years now, Middle Eastern and North African people, or MENA, haven't had proper representation in the census and have been required to define themselves as white or Caucasian. Although it seems that this issue will be remedied in the 2030 census, it still means that uh, as a group, many people haven't been properly represented and improperly accounting for minorities can have a serious effect on the allocation of government funding for them. I'm probably veering a bit off topic here, but the point is, identity does matter, whether it's on a micro or a macro scale. Albuja's paper also proposes the adoption of the term contextual racial presentation, or CRP, a form of code switching in which a biracial person's identity and their presentation of it changes depending on their environment. 
code switching isn't something that's necessarily exclusive to biracial people. Many minorities who have a narrower racial identity find themselves having to change various aspects of their behavior when in certain environments. CRP in terms of being biracial is a little different though. It means that the group or situation that you find yourself in can change the alignment of how you see yourself, how you identify, even without you even realizing it. For example, when I'm around other people with a Middle Eastern background, I can end up talking about our shared experiences and similarities with them. It could be things that we recognize as unique to the culture or the weird quirks that parents from that part of the world have, especially dads. Seriously, I'm not kidding when I say that Middle Eastern dads are absolutely bizarre at times. They're funny, embarrassing, and make for very interesting childhoods. Like, I remember going to a theme park when I was a kid and my dad got tired, so instead of stopping to get a drink or a snack, he decided to take a nap on a public bench, directly in front of a queue for a ride. He also likes gardening without a shirt on, which isn't necessarily the worst thing, but he does it so often that when my wife visited me from the UK for the first time, I had to remind him on numerous occasions to not be shirtless when we came back from the airport. He wore one, but I'm like 99% sure that I saw him running into the house to put one on when we pulled up. I love you though, Dad. He watches these videos, so uh, say hi to him in the comments. Also, if you have an Iranian dad or Middle Eastern dad, then please share your weird stories about them in the comments. Like, I, I know for a fact that this is such a universal thing that every one of you is bound to have something to say. So please share it. I will read every single one of them. If, on the other hand, I were to find myself in a company of whites, I am generally just seen as another white person like them and as a result can end up feeling that way, whether that's me subconsciously tapping into that part of my identity or wanting to fit in without the possibility of being judged. My wife has had similar experiences. She identifies as a person whose ethnicity is Jewish, but when among whites, she can present herself as just a regular white person and avoid possibly being judged for being Jewish by people who are sadly inclined to do so. When around other Jewish people though, she can be more comfortable and open about that part of her identity. On a social level, race is seen as something that's purely determined by the genetics of your parents and your skin color. This can create some interesting and varying definitions of identity, depending on which group you ask. A biracial person who's half white but with skin pigmentation might be seen as mixed race by some, but some might define them entirely by the other half of their racial makeup, and the part of them that's white isn't even considered. In some cases, biracial people can be denied part of their identity by others, and to be clear, this isn't something exclusive to being half white people who aren't mixed race might claim that a biracial person isn't allowed to define their identity because by being biracial, they're given different privileges by society. This is, to an extent, true, especially in the case of someone like me. I am half Iranian, but I have this, the white pass. Around other whites, I'm just another white person, and I have the same privileges as them. Other Middle Eastern people can look at me and generally recognize features that are familiar to them, including my dark under eyes, which you would be seeing right now if it weren't for the gift of concealer, or they might recognize my last name, Solari, which a lot of people assume is Italian since it ends with a vowel. To other whites though, I'm just white, unless I disclose otherwise. I can be around other Iranians and they treat me as no different to them. The skin doesn't matter, and even though I speak very limited Farsi, I belong. There have been occasions though in which people have tried to deny me of my right to say that I'm half Iranian because I have white skin, which I assume they do so in the belief that I'm trying to claim that I face discrimination on the same level as Middle Eastern people who can't hide their identity from others. I have mentioned in passing that I'm mixed race in a couple of videos that I've made, and on a couple of occasions had commenters who were furious at me claiming being Iranian as part of my identity, saying that growing up in the West means how I identify myself doesn't count, or 
questioning the extent of my experiences with Iranian culture. To be clear, I think it's shitty for a person to do something like this. I don't think anyone really has the right to question how you identify yourself, unless it's like a Rachel Dolezal situation, like she was white. But when people do, there's an unmistakable feeling of what can best be described as guilt, that even though you feel that something is part of your identity, it's not enough in the eyes of others, and you end up just keeping it to yourself, never truly feeling comfortable for the sake of the comfort of others. I think it's worth mentioning that there are other factors that play into biracial identity and what a person may veer towards more. According to Keisha L. Harris in her paper, Biracial American Colorism, Passing for White, context is important to how people identify themselves, such as their neighborhood, religion, gender, and even their income. She also claims that whiteness and the privilege that comes with being white has been internalized across all racial groups and therefore is a desirable goal in relation to social acceptance and success. In other words, if a mixed race person grew up working class around similar people who share part of their racial makeup, chances are that they'll identify closely to them. If they're from a wealthier background, though, they'll more than likely see themselves as white, or mostly white. She also states that appearance plays a role in how people can identify, which I personally can attest is true. So I guess the question I have to ask is, are biracial people allowed to choose their identity, or is it something determined by society or the color of their skin? Are they allowed to be fluid? I guess you could also ask the question, what percentage of a race does a person have to be to consider it as part of their identity? If you take an ancestry test from companies like 23andMe, you will more than likely find that there are parts of your racial makeup that you might not expect. Usually it's just a tiny percentage, and this has led to some people embarrassingly claiming that it's a core part of their identity, something which has been so commonplace that it's even become a running joke, especially in regards to American white progressives attempting to claim that they're part black, which isn't all too surprising considering how white people have been stealing and repackaging aspects of black culture for years. In fact, even the Brits are guilty of that. For example, Eric Clapton who's happy to steal blues music, but hates it when the people who made it try to listen when he plays it. Uh, Google this if you're curious. There was also the case of Senator Elizabeth Warren, who has proudly touted her Native American heritage throughout her life, something which became a hot debate after Donald Trump started to question her claims, albeit in an incredibly insensitive way. Shocker. In 2018, Warren took a DNA test to confirm her heritage, and even had a five-minute video produced in which she received the results. She was told that she, and I quote, absolutely has Native American ancestry in her pedigree, which she was delighted about, but it later turned out that the amount which she had was practically insignificant, with estimates ranging from 164th to 1-1024th. The publicity stunt was enough to upset various Native American groups, including the Cherokee Nation, who deemed the results useless, along with their Secretary of State Chuck Hoskins Jr. saying that using a DNA test to lay claim on any connection to the Cherokee Nation or any tribal nation, even vaguely, is inappropriate and wrong, and that it makes a mockery out of DNA tests and its legitimate uses, while also dishonoring legitimate tribal governments and their citizens whose ancestors are well documented and whose heritage is proven, Senator Warren is undermining tribal interests with her continued claims of tribal heritage. Warren later apologized for this whole situation. The original video she posted was removed and has become very difficult to find. I think it's more than fair to say that a tiny percentage of your genetic makeup shouldn't really allow a person to lay claim on it as a key part of their identity, especially when they've not experienced any part of the culture. You could ask, what percentage should count then? But I don't think I'm in a position to theorize what that number would be, and at the end of the day, I think that it's more complicated than percentages. All I know is that I can look at my dad and see that he's Persian, and when I look at my face in the mirror, 
I see his features the older I get. I know most people won't see those features unless he and I were side by side, but it's there because I'm half of him. I grew up in a household with a man who would speak in a different language when speaking with friends, one that sounds oddly hostile in tone at certain times, but he reassured me that it wasn't. He would cook meals that my friends had never heard of, listen to music that couldn't be found on a radio, and I spent time around his friends that were just like him. I may not have had a fully immersive experience, but I still feel like it's part of my identity, and personally I feel it's okay to do so. I believe anyone else who lives the biracial experience should be allowed to make decisions on their own identity, even if that means that it's something that's fluid. Policing other people's identity is a slippery slope, and as mentioned earlier, it can be alienating. I also don't think that it's really fair for people to make judgments on how your experiences allow you to qualify for certain identities, nor should a person have to show off their credentials. I fully understand that someone might think that a person like me might tell others that I'm biracial as a means of sort of playing a race card, and I get that, right? I'm a white guy, obviously, but I share that part of me because it's a part of me, and it's important to me. And I want it to be known that my life hasn't been exclusively a white experience. People might also assume that proclaiming your mixed race is an attempt to convince other people that you've faced as much adversity as a person of colour. Like if someone were to talk about how they've experienced racism and someone like me chimes in with, oh, I, I totally get it, Like I, I'm half Iranian, so I, I've been through the same thing. No, personally, I and many people like me would absolutely never claim that we've experienced racism on that level. I have white skin, so I get to hide in plain sight. Title of the video. Admittedly, I have been discriminated against directly on various occasions by people who know my background. When I was back in school, Islamophobia in the West was at an all-time high, and while the large Muslim student population there bore the brunt of it, I also had some people say some awful things to me, calling my dad a terrorist, calling me a half-terrorist, insulting my mother for being married to a Muslim man, getting called dirty, and those are just the things that I feel sort of comfortable repeating. I remember things like getting funny looks from my teachers when both my parents came to talk at a parent-teacher conference, or people who looked confused on the occasions that my dad picked me up from school. It's f***ed up, and it sucks, but I'm also very aware that those experiences are minute compared to what people of colour face because of my whiteness. I don't tell others that I'm half Iranian because I want to be seen as a victim on the same level as people of colour, or because it allows me to feel unique among white peers. I tell people about it because it is a part of who I am. Do I get to choose how I identify? I like to think I do, but I can also understand why people might want to deny me that choice, even though it can feel unfair. I can see why white skin might supersede the other half of my identity, but I also know how I feel about who I am and how I came to be. Also, um, if I'm being real with you, like, if you saw how much body hair I have, then you would have no doubts whatsoever that I am half Iranian. I may have some of my dad's facial features, but I also inherited his Persian rug if you catch my drift. Like, it, it looks like someone super glued the clippings from a barbershop floor on my chest. I get it waxed, but there is so much of it that I'm afraid that it's attached to some vital organs. Plus, I've been able to grow a beard since I was like 13. I am so tired of shaving. I don't need the Iranian side of me to be celebrated by others. I just like for it to be accepted, and I'm sure that every other biracial or mixed race person out there feels similarly. There's no point, I think, in forcing people to choose or prohibiting them from choosing, because there's no way to know how a person feels about themselves deep down, and all you can really do is listen and hopefully accept.
Thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed the video, then why not like and subscribe? I mean, it's free, so why not? While you're at it, why don't you click on the notification bell so you can get alerts for when my new videos come out. I'd like to thank all of the patrons you can see on screen who help make these videos possible, along with a special shout out to my patrons who pledge $5 or more. JP, Minty, Sonia Zatafa, Infernal Ramblings, Malcontent, Jacob Mayer, Zoe B, Potato Times, Mech, Ellisren, Joseph Blair, Jonathan Morris, Rose Jane, Caro Schultz, Bailey Grevling, Girls on Bear, Catherine Pendel, Azul Crescent, Candide, Dan McCrary, Remy Allen, Grant B, Alina, Ellie B, R. Atoms, Games, Sharfe, Mickey Buena Donna, Sparrow Wagon, Hawaiian Juicebox, Ruby O'Connor, Thomas Tomacano, Tadeo De Oria, Ryan Osterman, Alicia Crawford, Jay, Catherine, Gina I, Henry the Longshot, Lizzie Peasy, King Me, Fishcatch, Unevens, The Paltism, I am M, Super Stifle Dandelion, Haplo, Tande, Guts Weinweck, Best Friends Gang TV, Charlie, Chris Mothers, Locked In, Kev Yu, Lucky Number Devon, Matthew Torres, and Steve Ma. Thank you all very much for your support. It really does mean the world to me, and it really does help keep these videos going. Also, don't forget to follow me at Twitch at twitch.tv slash jsolari. I couldn't get Solari. I stream there every Tuesday and most Thursdays at around 2 p.m. EDT or EST, whenever you're watching this. But yeah, we have fun there. Usually just do a bit of chatting and it helps me fill my social interaction needs. This is a lonely job. I'd also like to give a very big thanks to my friends Alina and Dylan Reed Miller, and of course my dear wife who plucked up the courage to do her part for this video, so say nice things about her in the comments. She'll appreciate it. She reads them. Thank you again. Take care of yourselves. Take care of each other. Live, laugh, limp, biscuit, and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.